Hello, my name is James Payne, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Sloan School of Management in the System Dynamics Group. I'm happy to be uh, with everyone today, even though we are still in a virtual environment, uh, but it does give me a chance to talk with people around the world uh, about my uh, methodological contribution to this conference, uh, specifically um, related to modeling dynamic supply chains, and specifically supply chains with some concept of endogenous uh, allocation of uh, material through those supply chains. So when we talk about supply chains and system dynamics, uh, we're really talking about sort of uh, some of the original uh, core um, uh, models that were built uh, in this field, all the way back in the to Jay Forrester's industrial dynamics, uh, and you know more recently books. Uh, John Sturman's business dynamics uh, devote um, uh, two to three chapters discussing supply chain and commodity modeling, um, and even books uh, and articles outside of core system dynamics texts like this one on quantitative models for supply chain management and more recent behavioral operations um, um, have a lot of familiar names uh, to folks who have shown up to these conferences in the past. And I really, uh, behavioral operations is an emerging subfield within the OM field. Uh, is really taking this idea of, uh, of human decision making and choice and applying it to operations management and supply chain modeling. Uh, so when we talk about supply chain models, we can think of a classic supply chain model, this idea of inventory accruing, uh, being added to by some sort of production start rate and being diminished by some sort of shipment rate to an end customer based upon some concept of demand, uh, which in turn feeds back into this production start rate. Now, of course, your production start rate itself is not necessarily perfectly tied to what you want it to be. Uh, you don't just cause these units under all circumstances to sort of instantly come into existence. There's some concept of work in progress. You have to make uh, these units and they take time to make before they are in a finished good state and ultimately available for shipping. Uh, so work in progress itself can take many different forms. Here's one example uh, from a manufacturing supply line. But at the end of the day, work in progress, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind, is not this sort of uh, static holding uh, pattern or holding tank. It's not guaranteed, nor is it free. Um, production start rate does not necessarily directly translate into production rate. There might be line losses. There might be spoilage in the case of uh, foodstuffs. Additionally, um, having something in a work in progress state is, is costly. It ties up operational capacity and it ties up cash that could be spent for some other purpose. So at the end of the day, what is missing from this classical model of sort of production flow rate uh, through um, uh, work in progress and finished goods inventory? It's this tie right here um, removes the concept of choice. Really, if you're a producer, um, you have multiple options for what you do for your work in progress inventory and where it goes. And also you have a choice about whether or not to even do work in progress to begin with. Uh, for any given unit of time, do you allow development to continue or do you cut it off and maybe either remove it from your supply chain completely or move it along uh, in a state that is not ideal. Um, so when you think about the choices that are made in this space, one, I think intuitive way to make that choice is to consider the economic value assigned to each of these possible routes in any given period of time. And that really forms the basis for this framework. Taking uh, this concept of choice, uh, economically uh, uh, sort of feasible, uh, economically realistic choices, and using that to drive uh, material movement through a supply chain uh, versus sort of the classical method of using some sort of either fixed flow or nth order delay. So when you're talking about a single unit of production, uh, these choices are relatively straightforward. They, they either happen or they don't, depending upon which method is, or which uh, route is economic, most economically feasible in a given unit of time. Uh, when you extend it out to um, either multiple producers or multiple different goods within a supply chain, you can then start applying an aggregate view uh, and specifically maybe a, a, a logistic choice model uh, to the space to get an idea of what portion of your goods are in each of these disposition routes. This then allows us to replace uh, that connection from production start rate to production rate uh, with this model up in the top. And this model has, uh, in this example at least, has three different um, disposition routes, produce, uh, move to finished goods, destroy, uh, remove from your work in progress inventory entirely and perhaps free up uh, operational capital uh, or develop in the sense of leave it in that work in progress state for another unit of time. It's important to know that work in progress here uh, and its state is not directly uh, sort of the fraction of work in progress um, continuing development is not directly um, tied into the rest of this model and is instead um, implied via the uh, sort of economically viable choices of either moving it through the production uh, process uh, or removing it entirely through some sort of purposeful destruction. When we talk about economic viability, we have to have some concept of, of value. And what do we mean by that? 
we can actually go back to some of the original classic models to, to get a hint. Uh, these um, sort of fixed delays actually have an, uh, an implied um, idea of an ideal or typical development time, uh, some period of time in which uh, a piece of work in progress is most likely uh, to exit that state, uh, which in turn is most likely the time in which it is most economically viable for it to do so. Now, the choice of the function relating time in the work in progress state to the value of the end product might be different under different circumstances. Consider software development, where you might have re um, diminishing returns or increasing and then diminishing returns uh, with increasing um, sort of work in progress time versus something like commodity food stuff in which it might have no value at the very beginning, have a peak value uh, under some sort of ideal growth time, and then uh, reducing value as it rots in the field or perhaps uh, reduces your ability to plant other more seasonally appropriate crops as time goes on. So ultimately you end up with this, a uh, slightly more generic framework uh, for moving material through uh, a work in progress state in an inventory supply chain model. One that still captures the physical material flows, but also uses some concept of age in order to uh, discuss how that age affects the value of the material, which then uh, determines whether uh, the material either stays in the state of work in progress, is moved along uh, to some sort of finished good state, or is purposefully removed um, um, for, to free up operational uh, capability. Um, so one critique of this model is that there's only one work in progress state. It might be interesting or, or even necessary for you to consider multiple chained work in progress states. Uh, consider a vintaging chain, which you, you literally might be vintaging with some things like uh, a wine, or considered a nested um, um, uh, operational process in which um, uh, there are multiple um, sort of uh, production processes that feed into each other. So we can go ahead and extend this model uh, with the idea of sort of nth chained um, uh, sub cohorts of age and apply the same idea, the same uh, logistic choice model to each subgroup. Uh, what's interesting is then you can take this overarching uh, age value relationship and apply it to the entire uh, cohort uh, with each, which each cohort's value then corresponding to whatever that overarching age value relationship is. And then when you're done with this, you get something that's interesting and gives you a little bit more insight as to sort of like, oh, in aggregate, all of the things that are uh, units of production that are leaving my process, what's the distribution of ages amongst them? What's the distribution of, of material that's uh, in a destruction status? What's the, what's the average age across my material and how does it, and how does it um, sort of uh, compare to like a single aggregate stock? Uh, the cost of this is uh, additional complexity, additional parameters, um, and, and uh, possibly uh, not as much insight as, as one would hope. So at the end of, so at the end of the day, it, it really matters what is the context. Uh, something to note as well is that you can create an aggregate model and a vintaging model that have equivalent flows or even equivalent averages across different uh, parameters. Um, so in that sense, it is possible to take an aggregate model and explode it out into a vintaging chain if necessary. Uh, it should note that your assumptions that you make that go into that, specifically what you're fixing, uh, say either in this case, it was the destruction flow rate with a constant production start rate, starts breaking down if you start applying uh, different input signals uh, within that space. Uh, again, what it boils down to is, is you choose the framework that is behaviorally and operationally realistic and necessary for the context, while at the same time leaving uh, your ultimate model as parsimonious as, as, as you're able to while still extracting information. So as an example of a use of this particular modeling framework, uh, consider this, this guy, uh, uh, the emergence of uh, uh, the novel coronavirus and COVID-19. The reason we're doing this conference online to begin with, I took that modeling framework I introduced before and applied it to a model of a bifurcated supply chain, specifically to answer uh, a question related uh, to these observations, this idea that there was dumped milk and smashed eggs, and there is also uh, an excess amount of commodity foodstuffs that were being emerged. This was back in uh, March and April of 2020. Well, at the same time, there was this surge uh, in hunger uh, that was being observed and reported across the United States. And I think this article summarized it nicely. A tenth of the world could go hungry while crops rot in the fields. And the question for me was, how could this happen simultaneously? Clearly, there was a decision that was being made that was economically feasible for the producers uh, to, to like dump milk and smash eggs, while at the same time, the economics of the situation were making it difficult for people to acquire food within this space. So as I mentioned before, I created a model of a bifurcated supply chain and then applied an economic uh, submodel on top of that uh, that was based upon inventory management and spot price discovery uh, within that space. 
Um, and then also within uh, the producers specifically applied that logistic choice function that used these ideas of what the spot price is at a given point in time uh, to make a decision about whether or not to uh, leave food in the ground, uh, uh, remove it and destroy it, or move it into a finished uh, state. Uh, to uh, sort of exercise this model, I exposed it to a, a shock, a 50% loss in the bulk demand channel uh, for about 20 weeks. What's interesting is after I had already done some of this, some more data became available, and it turned out the reality was actually a bit more shocking than that. Uh, at least as reported by OpenTable, there was more or less a complete evaporation of restaurant demand um, in the bulk supply channel for about 24 weeks over the same period of time. So what this model allows us to sort of dive into and see things like this, that it became um, economically feasible for producers, the food under cultivation, for them to stop those production starts, while at the same time, within this space, um, uh, demand uh, uh, sort of jumped up for repackers and consumers, but that was tied directly into this concept of price at the same time, which emerges from the economic model that was applied at the back end. Um, what we end up getting out of this as well is an ability to dive into the specific ages of that material uh, and discover that why was this material uh, sort of um, uh, having these price fluctuations? Part of it is because uh, the producer with a surge in pricing um, was uh, economically motivated to harvest goods when it was below its ideal maturation time. But then later on, when it had the surge of goods that it was unable to sell, uh, material set fallow in the field and began to rot away and lose value at the same time. Um, so this really allowed us to see this idea that there were higher prices for less consumption of inferior quality goods across the supply chain. And that emerged from using this framework, specifically insights that come from acknowledging and modeling economically motivated choices that producers make. Uh, so I'm presenting this specifically as an example. Uh, the primary purpose of this talk is to present the methodology and this particular framework of this um, endogenous behavioral mechanism with logistic choice modeling, economic modeling, and physical material flows being, being superimposed across a uh, more um, traditional supply chain model. Uh, in order to generate um, more specific insights. Um, so I, I hope that this framework is useful and practical for a number of applications. In my case, I use that trapezoidal uh, uh, value function being applied to commodity food stuff, but I think it could also be applied to things like software development uh, or, or really any sort of material flow where you have to make a choice about whether or not to spend an additional unit of time making something, or you have um, you know, some sort of cost assigned to uh, keeping a unit of, of work in progress uh, under uh, production, as opposed to moving it to a finished good state. Um, and uh, I am happy to take feedback on this um, and uh, hear some other ideas about its application. And I'm also just very thankful for your time uh, and your presence at this conference. Hope everyone has an excellent week ahead. Thank you.